I've driven hundreds of new vehicles over the years, and here's the harsh reality I've learned in the process. Not all of them have to have personality, but it's much easier to remember the ones that do. And I'm not just talking about the way they drive here. Maybe there's something about the way a certain car or SUV comes together that really makes it stand out from its peers. Which brings us to the Volkswagen Atlas. You're definitely going to have to dig a little deeper to find anything close to that here, and you're certainly not going to find it in the way it drives. But if there's one thing this behemoth has going for it, it's pound for pound practicality. For more expert car reviews, don't forget to share our channel and subscribe so you can catch some of this and maybe even a little of that. Okay, so I should clear this up right out of the gate. I'm not saying that every vehicle has to be brimming with personality. And when I said that the most memorable ones are, well, I don't just mean for someone like me either who's cycling through so many vehicles. I mean more generally. Yeah, you're going to make your own memories, those family road trips or the first time you take the kids to the drive-in, but that's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about those inherent character traits and quirks. Not all of them are good, but they are what make these vehicles stand out in your mind more than anything else. Now, that's also what makes something like this so cozy, and I know I have said this before, but family haulers like this really are like mobile living rooms. They're places for you to get comfortable, get messy, and get around. Now, with that preamble out of the way, I do have to say that this interior is a pretty sterile space, but all this brown leather in this top trim definitely helps. It doesn't feel quite as cold, but it is a problem a little bit lower down the trim ladder where you can only get black, and I'm talking leatherette or cloth. It makes it look very desolate in here. But like I said, this one looks at least just a little bit better, but there are quite a few flat surfaces and it's just not all that aesthetically appealing. And the same goes with the outside. Now, as part of the refresh for 2021, it does look a little bit happier. It's got that smiling grill, but I still say that this is not very attractive overall. There's definitely a kind of brutalist aesthetic to the design here, and it really accentuates the size of the Atlas. But that size does have its benefits in here because it is absolutely massive inside. Now, here's the reality. Minivan is still the answer if you need all kinds of space. But if you just can't bring yourself to driving one of those and you also don't want to shell out for a big body on frame SUV like the Chevy Tahoe, this thing is as good as it gets. And I mean, just take a look in here. It is huge. It's way bigger than anything else like it. It's not very often that I can fit so comfortably in all three rows of seats, but this thing has all kinds of room. It doesn't matter which row I'm sitting in. The next biggest rival is probably the Ford Explorer, and that thing can't even touch this. Now, if you do want to swap that second row bench for captain's chairs, you can only do it in the top two trims. But either way, there's more than enough room for six or even seven people in here. I'm very impressed with the packaging and the same goes with the cargo area. Now behind the third row, there's 583 liters of space. That is very generous. Again, more than anything else like it. And then if you fold that third row down, well, you still get about 1,570 liters. So again, you're not gonna get any more than that this side of a bigger SUV or a minivan. Now, as you can see, our cargo testing pedal car patty fits back here a whole bunch of different ways, including with the third row of seats upright, which is a true testament to just how roomy this thing is. And you know, that's something you can do in the Ford Explorer, but here's something you can't. Hide your stuff, and I don't understand how the originator of this segment goes without a privacy cover for your cargo. That's very strange to me. Here's something I really like about this one too. 
there's this spot to hide it under the floor. So it's there until you need it. You're not gonna leave it in your garage and then realize it's missing, but it's not perfect back here. And for a few different reasons. First and foremost, you can't use that behind the third row of seats, only behind the second. That's very strange to me. If I wanna take my whole family out for a shopping trip, I'm out of luck if I wanna hide stuff from prying eyes. And then the other thing, just take a look. The privacy cover doesn't extend all the way to the second row seat backs. I don't get that. And you know, my camera guy, Will, and I were talking about it, and he said, well, it's because the second row seats reclined, which is true, but here's my problem. Lots of other brands have that too. And they have this little flap with rubber feet on the end, so you can lift it up when you need it and drop it down if you want to recline those seats. And something else I have a problem with, no power release buttons for those second row seats. That means you got to do it the old fashioned way and run to either side of the vehicle and use the levers there. It's not such a big deal, though I would appreciate some added convenience. And finally, my last problem. This thing does have a power tailgate and there are a whole bunch of different ways to open it, but not so many ways to close it. I found that out the hard way. Key fob, no luck. Button on the inside of the door, can't do it that way either. The only way to close this thing, this button up here. I don't get that at all. I have never seen that in a modern vehicle. Now, if you watch my reviews, you'll know I'm a big fan of practicality and functionality. So those pain points do seem like pretty simple ones to address, but other than that, everything in here is very approachable in a very typical Volkswagen sort of way. So take a look at these controls. They're all very easy to understand. You don't need to crack the owner's manual to figure out what any of them mean because they're all very well labeled and they fall readily to hand. My only complaint really is about this infotainment system. And here's the catch. Now, as part of the refresh for 2021, you can get the latest version of Volkswagen's infotainment system. I think it's the third gen, but this one I'm driving, it's an early production run of the 2021 version of the Atlas. And that means it has the old gen two software. What's the biggest difference? Well, no wireless Apple CarPlay or Android auto connections. And the other thing is this touchscreen, well, it's resistive, more like a traditional in-car touchscreen, as opposed to the new one is capacitive touch, which will behave a lot more like your smartphone. So you can pinch and swipe to move around. That part's kind of cool. And this one still does work well. It's just the lack of wireless connections that really stands out. And you don't get USB-C ports in here, just USB-A. Now, one thing that's the same, no matter whether you're talking about the second gen or third gen infotainment that I absolutely can't stand are these touch sensors instead of physical buttons around the infotainment system. You do get physical knobs for volume and tune, but instead of buttons to navigate to your different functions like the radio or your phone, you get these touch sensors and there's also no home button. I don't get that at all. And then something else I don't like about Volkswagen system in general is the way this toolbar raises when you place your hand in front of the screen. And I do kind of get it because it hides those features so you have a bigger screen to show you whatever function you're on, but it gives you that moment of kind of what's happening when you raise your hand in front of it, I really do try to focus on what's happening on the road in front of me instead of what's happening on the screen. But you know as well as I do, sometimes you do need to switch between the radio and your navigation. And there's just that split second that you don't really know what's going on. Again, maybe you'll get used to it over time, but I'm not so crazy about it. But I do like the fact that you get Apple CarPlay and Android Auto, even if they are hard connections in this second gen system. Something else I do really like in here are these physical controls for the HVAC system. You get knobs for temperature and fan speed, buttons for defrost auto and AC. This is also where you get your buttons for the heated and ventilated front seats that come in the top two trims. And I do have to say they are very comfortable for long haul cruising. There's not much contouring to them, but I was surprised at just how comfortable they are over the long term. And this leather that comes in the top trim is very nice to the touch. It's nice and buttery. You also get tons of very straightforward controls on the steering wheel. And just like the rest of them, you don't need to open the owner's manual to understand what any of them do. And this is also how you control the digital gauge cluster that you get in this top trim. And it is very cool. You can reconfigure it a whole bunch of ways, including pulling up a map with turn by turn directions right there in the gauge cluster. You can even make the map span the entire gauge cluster. That is very handy. But one thing I don't get, there's no head up display available in this top trim. And I really don't think that's too much to ask for the money because this thing isn't exactly cheap. 
Now, if you do want this exact line model, you're gonna pay about 57 and a half grand before tax. That is competitive with the Hyundai Palisade, the Honda Pilot, or the Toyota Highlander. But again, there are a few key features missing for the money. If you take a look at that Palisade, for example, you get a digital gauge cluster and a head-up display in the top trim. Now, the gauge cluster thing, it isn't quite as advanced as this one, but that's not the point. It's that you can get all that stuff, but then even some more basic features are missing here. Considering the size of this thing, you know, this really is sort of a minivan replacement. So it does seem like Volkswagen took the easy way out on some stuff. Take a look at the PA system you get in the Honda Pilot and I think even the Palisade that allows you to amplify your voice so people even in the third row can hear what you're what? saying from up here. You don't get that at all. There's not even one of those drop down convex mirrors so you can keep an eye on the kids in the back. Again, those are just the little things that you wonder why they're not here. But something this does have in common with all of those is V6 power under the hood. Now, this top trim is the only one that comes with the 3.6 liter standard. The rest of them get a turbocharged four cylinder like you'd get in something like the Subaru Ascent. If you wanna add it to the Comfort Line or High Line, you're gonna pay about 2,200 bucks more, but it is well worth the money if you plan to do any towing. Now, don't get me wrong, Turbocharged four cylinders are capable of towing, but they're just not gonna do as well as something like this V6, especially out on long highway runs because they have to work just a little bit harder. So you're really gonna watch that fuel needle drop in real time. So this is the way to go. If you wanna take advantage of the 5,000 pounds of towing capacity that you get with the Atlas when it's configured properly. This engine makes 276 horsepower and 266 pound-feet of torque, so it's not gonna jump off the page, but it is competitive with other V6s like it. Something else I like, it is a little bit peaky, but you do hit that maximum torque at just 3,500 RPM, so there's not a big run-up. And when you do get your foot into it a bit, it does take off pretty well. I wouldn't say this thing is fast, but there is more than enough momentum there. But something that isn't quite competitive is the fuel economy of this thing. Now, I have been doing a little bit better than the official ratings this week, and we'll get to that in a second. But if you take a look in the NRCAN fuel consumption guide, this thing is rated at almost 13 liters per 100 kilometers combined. And if you take a look at that V6 powered Toyota Highlander, it's rated to burn just 10.3 liters per 100 kilometers combined. And then the Palisade and Pilot are rated right around 11. That is a major difference. Now I have been burning just around 12 liters per 100 kilometers this week. So it is possible to do better than its official rating, but I've been doing a lot of highway driving. I can't imagine how much worse I would be doing around town, but here's something it does just as well as the rest of those, ride quality. Now it's not quite adaptive damper smooth, but it does a nice job of damping most things you'll encounter on the road. And that's impressive considering this one I'm driving is riding on 21 inch wheels since it has the R-Line package, but that is where the compliments end when it comes to drivability. Because first of all, there is just a ton of body roll to contend with. And then to make matters worse, there is just no steering feel whatsoever. And I'm not looking for sports car steering here, but this is about as lifeless as anything I have ever driven. And there's just no sense of a connection between what's in your hands and which way the front wheels are pointed. It's not quite disconcerting. It's just not all that comfortable for me to drive. And there are lots of better options out there. Even bigger ones like that Tahoe has a way more steering feel than this thing does. Something else I'm not down with is that you only get lane keep assist in this top trim. That to me is just totally unacceptable. That's something you get in every version of the Palisade, the Pilot, and the Highlander, as well as a whole bunch of other advanced safety stuff. Now you do get decent stuff even in the base trim. So you get forward collision warning as well as blind spot monitoring. And then if you step up to the second trim, you get adaptive cruise control. But the fact there's no lane keep assist in any trim but this one, that to me is a no go. You shouldn't have to get this close to 60 grand before you get such a basic feature, especially considering nowadays, a lot of vehicles, that might be one of the only advanced safety features you get. If you take a look at something like, I don't know, the Hyundai Venue, that's like 18,000 bucks or so with the automatic transmission, I'm pretty sure you get lane keep assist in that. The fact that you have to spend this much money to get it takes the Atlas right off my shopping list. 
This one I'm driving, well, it's right around 59,000 bucks before tax since it has that R-Line package. Again, that is quite a bit of money, but you do get a lot of good stuff for the price. You get the heated and ventilated front seats, a heated steering wheel, heated rear seats, tri-zone automatic climate control. There's also some stuff you might not expect in here like this digital gauge cluster first and foremost, but then there's a lot of stuff I think is missing like a head up display or power folding back seats, or even that PA system or a convex mirror. That again is the kind of stuff that makes it a proper family hauler. And I think the Atlas is missing the mark there. All told, I would say it's a pretty competitive package for the price, but there's just some stuff I would struggle with from a practicality and functionality perspective, as well as those missing features that really make it hard to justify. To recap, I love how spacious the Atlas is for people and stuff, the comfy seats up front and the approachable controls. I don't like the cold and sterile styling, the lifeless steering or that lane keep assist only comes in the top trim. If family haulers really are like living rooms on wheels, then this is one that you just never got around to hanging any artwork in. You can still get comfortable in there, it's just never going to feel all that cozy. I also wish it wasn't such a drag to drive, and not because I was hoping for something sporty, but just because it feels even bigger than it is from behind the wheel. But you know, that really is what the Atlas has going for it, its sheer size. Is that enough to make it a worthy pick? Well, I'll leave that up to you, but I just don't think I could live with all the sacrifices here. It's not that I'm saying don't buy the Atlas, but before you do, I'd suggest you check out what else is out there too.